I grew up in a remote location where my parents farmed all their working life. I fully appreciated living and spending time in the countryside and being in regular contact with the local wildlife. But one animal rarely seen was the local deer population. It was certainly there, hoof prints in the mud would be pointed out by my father. But to see one was a very rare event, maybe once, twice a year, making it a real point of conversation around the dinner table on an evening. Now move forward a few decades and into a new century. It's the complete opposite. Today it's a rare day when I do not see a deer when I'm out with the dogs. Plus sadly, the number of deer you see on the roadside, hit by traffic, is forever increasing. I can fully believe a line I recently heard that there are more deer in the United Kingdom today than at any time since the Norman Conquest over a thousand years ago. And that number is still increasing. For sure you'll be surprised, look at the policy in the past 40 years of planting acre after acre of new woodlands and mile after mile of new hedgerows. From a deer's perspective it's a new housing estate, purpose built. Even the hedges give them avenues to travel from one woodland to the next. I know I'm not alone in enjoying and watching a herd of deer, or even just the odd deer, but with their ever increasing numbers comes problems. A large herd of wild grazing animals will impinge on other species, plus the wider countryside and farming, with continual damage to crops. To look at the ever increasing task of deer management, I have joined a good friend of mine, Rob, and today we will look at the small boar-like munjack deer. As a breed, the munjack has seen an enormous increase in its population. In fact, no other species in the British Isles have seen such growth in recent years. I'm Surjit Mawalha, but I've been called Rob or sometimes Bob by several fellow stalkers. And over the years, it has stuck. I've long had an interest in deer stalking and wider field sports, along with the love of the countryside. It is hard to pinpoint where this interest started but I'm sure it was due to my father back in Kampala. My father Chetan grew up against the rising unrest with partition of India following independence. This displaced as many as 20 million people, resulting in a refugee crisis and violence, and most of the displaced were my parents, who moved to Kenya, where my father continued his apprenticeship, and after qualifying, his work took him to Uganda, where I was born. Life was comfortable for me growing up in Uganda. It was here I had my first taste of hunting and shooting, and I would spend days out in the countryside, following closely in my father's footsteps. I attended school in Kampala, but while preparing for my examinations, my family were forced to move. This time, it was in the hands of Idi Amin, the self-declared president of Uganda, following his military coup in 1971. We arrived safely in the UK, staying first with family before moving into our own house. Today I'm semi-retired, which gives me time to help with my passion for the countryside and deer control and management. In addition, I'm a member of UK Deer Track and Recovery as a volunteer. The munchak arrived in the UK as an ornamental species in the early 20th century. They were initially imported to private estates for their small size and distinctive appearance. However, they soon escaped establishing a wild population, especially in the south and eastern areas of England. Unlike other deer species, munchak do not have a traditional breeding season or rut and can breed all year round female munjak can start breeding at just seven months old and are capable of conceiving again within days of giving birth. The munjak day's ability to adapt to various habitats, their high re reproductive rate and the absence of natural predators have all contributed to their population explosion. Consequently, their population has soared, resulting in conflicts for conservationists farmers and landowners. In 2019, 
the Munchak was classified as an invasive alien species, making it illegal to release them into the wild or sell live Munchak. To effectively manage the Munchak, culling has become a necessary and responsible course of action. Uh, Rob, uh, thanks for your time this afternoon. Uh, I'm fascinated by your story that you've told me about your escape from Uganda. I mean, given that you and the family had to leave with very few possessions and, dare I say it, in fear of your life, uh, what was that journey like? What were the challenges you actually faced in escaping from Uganda? It was more worrying times for my father. I was quite young. I was, I was in my teens at the time. He had a big family, eight children. Uh, the government wanted him to stop because they did government contracts. But with having a big family, he didn't want to send the family away and him stay back in Uganda, not knowing what was going to happen in the future. And one of the times we were going into town and we were stopped at uh, an army checkpoint. For whatever reason, the soldier decided to have a go at my father and he beat him up with the, the butt of the rifle. Turned his attention to me, which wasn't too bad. He only just poked the barrel, rifle, rifle, barrel of the rifle into my face and just got the top of my eyes. And uh, for whatever reason, the soldiers turned their attention to another car, just two or three cars past us. And uh, with that, my father asked uh, the driver to start the car. We jumped in and promptly got away from the situation. And when the time came to leave, my father's driver came to pick us up to take her to the bus stop where we were going to catch the bus to go to Entebbe Airport. My father asked him to help whatever he wanted from the house. And we basically left with a suitcase each and 50 pounds each. And we caught the bus to Entebbe Airport, went through the usual procedures, and there was security there checking everybody out, and any jewellery the ladies had on them was taken off them. Fortunately, nothing happened while we were there, onto the plane, and safely landed at Heathrow, where we were met by family and a couple of days later, we travelled on watch the leads. In recent years, there's been a remarkable increase in both the deer population and an interest in deer stalking. If somebody today expressed an interest in deer stalking, what advice and guidance would you give them? My advice would be to find themselves a mentor or an experienced stalker to take you on to learn from them the best way to go about it. There are deer training courses available throughout the country, which is certainly the way to go. And certainly some of the police forces are recommending that they do the deer stalking training before they let them have a firearm certificate. Well, certainly in my case, I was very fortunate when I started deer stalking in Scotland and became very interested is interested in the deer themselves. Uh, it wasn't just a case of pulling the trigger. And the stalker, two stalkers took me under their wings and I learned a lot of them. Left uncontrolled, deer populations can have significant ecological impacts, damaging woodlands, native vegetation and agricultural crops, which in turn affect local biodiversity and habitat quality. Additionally, the growing number of road traffic accidents involving deer or caused by deer pose a significant concern. This costs the insurance sector as much as 80 million per year and leads to the loss of approximately 45,000 deer. In addition, Traffic accidents cause injuries to around 400 people. Tragically, as many as 20 people are fatally injured in such accidents every year. 
deer fencing and physical barriers can be erected to exclude deer from sensitive areas. Such measures are limited in their effectiveness and can be costly. Plus fencing is not possible in all situations and can result in deer populations being displaced to other areas. Effective culling, on the other hand, offers a cost-effective solution as skilled stalkers target specific individuals to reduce population densities in designated areas. Deer culling and deer management play a vital role in preserving ecological balance. Through responsible and targeted population control measures, we can mitigate the negative impacts of the unchecked growing deer populations. As Robert so well highlighted, deer culling and management play a crucial role in safeguarding the health of our wild deer populations and maintaining a balance in the countryside. By maintaining well-regulated culling practices, we can control deer numbers and prevent overpopulation, which, if left unchecked, can lead to devastating consequences for both the deer and their habitats. Through calculated culling, we can mitigate the spread of disease amongst the deer herds and reduce the risk of starvation during harsh winters. Additionally, managing deer populations help protect native plant and animal species that depend on specific ecosystems, fostering biodiversity and preserving the delicate ecological balance. Moreover, responsible deer management ensures that deer populations do not encroach excessively on farmland and forests, preventing damage to crops, vegetation and tree saplings, thereby benefiting the agricultural and forestry sectors. Ultimately, by recognising the importance of deer culling and embracing well-informed sustainable management practices, we can ensure the long-term well-being of both the wild deer populations and the countryside they inhabit. Mm -hmm.